blessing, a blessing, a blessing. Amen. Thank God for, amen, Sharice, Lady Sharice being in the house. Let's give God a hand praise for her as always. Amen. Uh, let's see. We are going to jump headlong into our series on emotionally healthy relationships, the ties that bind. We have been talking about this for the last couple of weeks uh, in a kind of very direct and indirect manner. Um, certainly, uh, it is worth noting that our, our relationships are what make our lives uh, most um, meaningful. Um, the quality of our relationships, the depth of our relationships, the consistency of our relationships, the health of our relationships, uh, that we are a people who are in the image of God created as deeply relational beings. The Christian theological treaties, the Christian theological uh, assumptions and, and reflections throughout history, even as they describe and attempt to make sense of God and God's existence and God's presence is a deeply relational description that God is not in and of God's self uh, just a radical individual, but even within the life of, of God, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it is a perichoretic, an interdependent relationship. And this is paradigmatic for all of us. It is our reflection. It is how we uh, should understand ourselves. If we have been created in the image of God, then we should always appreciate then that if God is relational within God's self, then we then must be relational as God's creation. That makes sense to everybody. Amen, that we are a, a out, outflowing of who God is. Uh, one of the early church fathers, Origen, always talked about how, uh, you know, all of creation, all that exists flows from God's being. And that uh, if the devil represents anything, the devil, Satan, however we describe uh, the concret concretizing of evil, is the furthest one can be from God and still exist. Right? That, you know, if, 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 if the, the, the devil can only exist even as the devil is an extension of God because God creates all. And so there, therein, it, it, it helps us to keep appreciating that when the early, uh, I think it was the Epicureans, when Paul was talking to them on the mountain and they said, in God we live and we move and we have our being, that even in a different religious tradition, there was this sense that we are all connected to God. That was one of the, the messages we preached several weeks ago about when Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches and apart from me, you can do nothing. This whole series on relationships then is really attempting to help us come to grips with the power of relationships. First, our relationships with God as we are tied to God through spirit, um, our relationships with one another, as we are tied to one another through our connection, both uh, often culturally, geographically, uh, uh, familial, uh, marriage, friendship, even on your job. Somebody say amen. Amen. Some people like, I, I pray those are the most temporary connections because some of these folk on my job I don't want to be around them too much longer uh, we, we, we understand relationships to be uh, how they how we exist within our church community amen I often you know done this through the years just look around the room and go ahead look around the room and just look at folks make eye contact with a few folks you don't know and just just trip that if you saw them on the street you probably wouldn't even say hi to them amen you know, that is <laughs> something very interesting about how coming into a church setting introduces you to people you otherwise would never meet. You would never have anything in common with them outside of your connection to church. We, we, we want to talk about our relationships to the poor and the hurting among us, those who are deeply, deeply impacted by systemic and structural violence and, and, and exploitation. And then we, we also need to spend some time over the next month or so talking about the ties that bind us that have caused us harm. That some relationships throughout our lives have not always been life-giving. Somebody say amen, right? 
that some of these relationships have left such an imprint and a, 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 a mark on our memory, on our soul, on our heart, that those relationships often last, have lingering effects. We need to talk about relationships that may need to be redefined, or dare I say, broken. Amen. Some folks, you just have to let them go. Amen. Also, reconciliation and forgiveness, and we've experienced the kind of uh, uh, inadequate nature of both of these terms in the way Western Christian church often uses these uh, ideas and words to take accountability and justice out of the equation, right? And use it to just try to gloss over difficulty. And so there's all these different ways that we, we want to talk about relationships. And so uh, we certainly want to, um, you know, use these, these, these curriculums and these texts. We have a couple of, of texts that we're using, the Emotionally Healthy Relationships. Uh, your life group leader should have these or be making these available to you as you show up to your groups. Uh, one of these books in particular is a very powerful book. It's a 40-day it's a, a, a journey to deepen your relationships and change. And they have some very fascinating and cool exercises in here. Now, I just ought to say that because of the uniqueness of our congregation, every time we use any text, uh, most of these have to be adapted to our context. Somebody say amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them adaptation, amen. This is what we, 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 we got to do remix. We, we, this is where we tap into hip hop, the hip hop sensibilities of our church, amen. You have to take some of this stuff and, and, and make, it, make it fit our context. I was talking with uh, Sister Adrian, uh, who leads our virtual live group and I heard we had some cool folks on, there, on that group and she was just sharing with me about uh, how they had to uh, uh, inject some of their womanist sensibilities into the conversation around uh, how do you address issues that are often considered microaggressions. Sometimes people just want you to gloss over those, but sometimes you gotta say, wait a second, you know, I'm not gonna just gloss over something when it needs to be confronted, right? And so there are some ways that we're all gonna have to take some of this stuff and make it, make it uh, most applicable, but I do think there's a wonderful framework for us to, to dive into. And so for the next six weeks or so, our preachers are gonna be kind of preaching and teaching from some of the texts that are found in our curriculum that will help us uh, be able to, to dive deep, hopefully into these themes and I pray that you and I, all of us, will come out of this series with more tools and a greater commitment to have more emotionally healthy relationships. So, uh, with that being said, Matthew chapter 7 is where we're going to spend our time today. Matthew chapter 7, it is the last chapter of the three chapters in the book of Matthews 5, 6, and 7 that uh, uh, capture Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These are some of the most uh, you know, famous words that Jesus ever declared. Uh, some people like to reduce uh, a lot of Jesus' uh, ministry, teaching, and wisdom to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gives you basic rules and guidelines for living relationally as it relates, again, as we've said, uh, our relationship to God, our relationships to ourselves, and our relationships to others and creation. The Sermon on the Mount uh, gives us all of these kinds of these declarations that if you take them seriously, they would mess you up, mess us up if you take it seriously. That's why, you know, we can only take the Bible serious a little bit at a time, at least the words of Jesus. Somebody say amen, because our whole world would be upside down if we really tried to implement everything Jesus said all at the same time. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I need Jesus in doses, amen. <laughs> I wish I had a real church up in here, amen. And, and if, if you doubt me, let's just kind of read the first, you know, 10, 11 verses of this passage. And let's just see if you really took Jesus seriously, would you be doing what Jesus is telling you not to do in this passage? Verse number one. Now, this is the passage, if you read the King James or the New King James, preferably you're not, but if you are, that's fine. Or the New Revised Version or the NIV, this passage would probably talk about judging. Judge not that you be not judged, but the, the message translation makes it very much more plain. And so I thought I would read it from the message translation to kind of uh, create a little bit of uh, dissonance in your, uh, in your uh, uh, understanding of this passage as we try to 
preach and teach on it from a perspective of relationships. So verse number one, talking about taking Jesus in doses, right? Yeah. If you really took Jesus seriously, how hard would it be to follow these words? Don't pick on people. There it is. All right. Let's, let's pray. No, right? <laughs> Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Amen. That's what, you know, that's what Jesus is saying according to Eugene Peterson, right? That, that, that by itself could, could, could shut a whole lot of things down. We're talking about healthy relationships. We probably could just make those our three points. First point, tell your neighbor, don't pick on people. Second point, don't jump on their failures. Third point, don't criticize their faults. Man, you want to talk about some healthy relationships up in here, right? Amen. And he's like, let's just pray. Where's the altar? We're going to do an altar call. Give me the oil. We all going to repent, right? Amen. Sometimes the word is so easily explained, right? All right. Don't do all of these things, Jesus says, unless, everybody say unless, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. I was going to preach. Uh, that was going to be the title of my sermon. Amen. Uh, 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 relationships are like boomerangs. But then I realized that that may have other impacts that I didn't get a chance to think through that much. So I, I, I didn't do that. I have a more simpler uh, sermon title, I think, called uh, They Can't Read Your Mind or something like that. All right. Uh, <laughs> Verse number, verse number, the critical spirit has a way of boomerang. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Amen. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face. Now don't tell that to your, na to your neighbor, to your boss, or even to your partner. That may not go that well. Say it to yourself, all right? Wipe that smear off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Hallelujah. Verse number six, don't be flipped with the sacred. Banter and silliness give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans. In trying to be relevant, you're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. Woo. That's, that's, that's heavy. Amen. Verse number seven. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse Hide and seek game we're in. Now, you know, you may be familiar with this passage in the more traditional reading. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye will find. Knock and the door will be open. But again, you know, sometimes these new uh, uh, updated translations can, can just give you a little bit more things to think about. If your child asks for bread, do you trick your child with sawdust? If they ask for fish, do you scare them with a live snake on their plate? As bad as you are, you would never think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think, listen to this, I love this language, the God who conceived you in love will be even better. Some rich language. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic, they can't read your mind. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes teaching and preaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them they can't read your mind. <laughs> amen, amen. Some of, us like, some of us be like, I can't read my own mind. Amen. I'm, I'm. Now, uh, uh, again, appreciating that all of our relationships are grounded or should be grounded or flowing from our dependence on God 
Aware of our interdependence on others and creation is certainly prayerfully committed to our stewardship of self. Relationships, uh, all of our relationships should at their best be life-giving. They should be unlocking within us the capacity to not only receive life, but give life. And that, unfortunately, to the extent that our relationships are, are unhealthy, life can be truncated. Life can be uh, 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 choked off in a way where, uh, you know, it becomes almost difficult to imagine that uh, life is within your grasp when you are in certain kinds of relationships. And even though uh, you may always be related to folk, sometimes your relationships may not be worth you staying invested in. Mm -hmm. And this is the challenge, this is the trial, right, of, 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 of these relationships, uh, that uh, some relationships are permanent, some relationships are temporary, some relationships are seasonal. But I want to suggest that all relationships should be life-giving. And, 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 and because we serve the God of resurrection, how many of you know that when God is at the center of our relationships, all relationships have the capacity to be resurrected, to have new life breathed into them. Do I have a witness in here, amen? amen. That, that it, it took years, <laughs> decades. I mean, I work with a lot of young people in the community uh, all across the country, and it's fascinating talking to young people and older folks, amen, folks that come home from jail or prison, and they've been out of relationship with their families and with their loved ones, and, 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 and when they learned how to heal and learn how to develop more healthy practices, the relationships that they thought would never be resurrected now have produced life. Life for all parties involved. It is this, 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 this assumption that I want to press on us that even though we have many kinds of relationships, all of our relationships, when they are healthy and grounded in God, should be pushing you to a better, more faithful version of who you've been created to be. Now, living in a fallen world, which is our kind of theological uh, kind of assumption, that the world as it is today is not the world that God intended from the beginning. That because of the injection of sin, our rebellion, our, our, our deciding that God, rather than following your ways, we'd rather follow our own ways. People tell me all the time, why am I responsible for what they did in the garden? I tell them, okay, tomorrow just start from scratch. <laughs> and wake up tomorrow, you and God in right relationship, and just do the right thing from here on out. All right, now then you ain't got to be responsible for what they did in the garden, right? Uh, the, the reality is all of us, everybody say all of us, all of us in our relationship to God often choose our own way. <laughs> oh, help me, Jesus, amen. We choose our own way. I mean, we know what God says to do, and then we'd be like, I, God, I, but God, really, like, you, with them? And that's how many of us feel, you know. Uh, I, I was in a meeting uh, some time ago, and, and people were saying how we had to, we need to, we need to break up with America, you know. I'm, I'm about to just break up with America, you know. Me, me and America have been in a bad relationship for our whole existence. I'm about to break up with America. And I said, wow, that, that sounds heavy, yeah. amen. Uh, and I guess conceivably you could. You have to go live somewhere else where the reach of America does not, Go, but you know, with America being a global empire, and the and the and the sensibilities of this capitalistic, you know, imperialistic project reaching all over the world, it'd be hard for you to break up with America. Why don't you just break up with all the things that make America? <laughs> yes, that's a good way to put it. 
break up with all things that make America, America. <laughs> and this is the reality. Much of what makes America, America lives within many of us, all right? It is our inability to be in right relationship with the creator, with what God has created, and with ourselves. And so even if you broke up with America, the truth is you're still going to have to live somewhere and be in right relationship with God, be in right relationship with others and all that God has created, and be in right relationship with yourself. Which kind of means that, you know, although America is problematic, amen, there are always opportunities for our relationship to America, to systems, to, to empires, to people, to things, to always be open and, 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 and have the opportunity for a more faithful expression of life. And, and, and certainly this week, you know, the last 24 hours, the last 48 hours, the last two weeks, we continue to, to be uh, 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 shown what happens when our relationships are toxic or, or over-determined by by racism and, and dehumanization and exploitation and greed and violence. We see that people who have the ability to make decisions can totally expose vulnerable folks to weapons of war, whether it's in churches or synagogues or mosques, whether it's in whole regions of the world where you are thinking or at least hoping that the presence of weapons would keep others from using their weapons, but it's a reality that the presence of weapons actually create more death, right? And so my prayer for us is how then, God, can we create or cultivate tools, cultivate practices that help us be more faithful and life-giving in our relationships. Again, appreciating that not every relationship you have is created equal. Some of your relationships will require more attention than others. Some of your relationships will require stronger boundaries than others. Some of your relationships will require a, 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 a certain kind of, of grace and, and self-care, but all of these relationships still require not your control, but your stewardship, meaning God, what is within my power to do to help steward these relationships in my life towards life? And one of the challenges we have as human beings is we get stewardship and control mixed up. We think that we have the power to control our relationships when in actuality, all you have the power to do is steward them. You have the power, limited power, but enough. We said this, I think, a couple weeks ago, right? Limited power, but enough. Everybody say limited power, limited power. but enough. But Amen. Enough. You do not have all power. Amen. You're not Thanos. You're not like, you know, the, the folks that got all the stones and with a snap of fingers you can unmake reality. Even Thanos, amen, met somebody that had more power than him eventually. I think he said, I am Iron Man, right? And then Thanos just drifted off into, I mean, there's always somebody who has more power than you. But you do have enough power to be able to say no, to say yes, to say when, to say how, and to do it in ways that are life-giving prayerfully to you, to those within your charge, and even to the person you're in relationship with. And so one of the first things that I believe is so important if we're going to take seriously, how do we ensure that these relationships are, are healthy? Uh, the scripture is fascinating. Jesus, in all of his lessons, makes things so plain, but they are always so hard to live into. And this is why I think Jesus was such a compelling figure, but after a while, he became such a divisive figure. Because Jesus was loved by people who he healed, raised from the dead, provided food for, 
But people in power, they didn't like Jesus so much. Because Jesus would often tell them things that were so uncomfortable. They were like, why do you keep saying this? Every time you see me, you're telling me things that I don't want to hear. And eventually, Jesus became such a threat to their power, their perceived power, that they ended up putting Jesus on a cross. And it's always worth noting that healthy relationships should require you and I to be uh, pushed beyond our capacity, right, but never damaged to a place of destruction, right? No relationship you're in should lead to your damage or destruction, but it should push you, man, to be better. Amen. And that's the thin line. Man, depending on who you're in relationship with, because some folks, they just bring the devil out of you. Somebody say amen, right? You ever been on your job or your school? I'm not going to talk about your family because that just may be a little too close. But, you know, you've been in relationship with folk, and they, every time you're around them, Lord, you feel like the dark cloud just comes over your desk. you be like, oh, oh come on. <laughs> but is there a way to think about even those relationships as a way of God attempting to bring life? out of you. One of the first things that I think the scripture teaches us as relates to how do we have healthy relationships is found in the first several verses. We're going to call this first point, what does it mean to self-reflect before you criticize? Uh Right? And so verse number one through four, five, we already kind of talked about it. Don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures. Don't criticize their faults unless, of course, you want the same treatment. And then it goes on to say that critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's always easy to smudge on your neighbor's face, be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face when your own face is distorted by contempt? What does it mean before you take note of the fault in your neighbor? That you take a step back and say, what is happening in me? that is making this fault such a trigger. Now, that's not the end of this process, but I want to suggest that healthy relationships are often characterized by, I think Pastor Nisha leading an Adulting 101 series, right? Adults who can take a moment of self-reflection. Rather than just react. Now, I have found that sometimes even this gets weaponized by folks. Because often people will gaslight you or do the whataboutisms, you know. Uh, you know, how come, uh, you know, uh, 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 we were supposed to be working on this project on our, on, on our job and it was due at this time. And you really let me down. Then the person will just be like, well, what about that time? And it's like, you know. <laughs> And, and it is it just like every time you bring up something, it's a what about? Anyone ever been in a conversation with, with those kind of folks make you want to bang your head up against the wall? That's a self-damaging relationship. Those kind of folks, you'd be like, okay, you a what about her, and I'm going to be outie, right? I'm going to let you, <laughs> let, you, let you drown in your what aboutisms. But people in relationships of integrity should always be reflective, self-reflective. And what does it mean for you and I to slow down our conflicts and our disagreements to ask, what is it about me that is causing this situation to devolve into a relationship that is not life-giving? Now, You may go through the self-reflection process and still come out the other end very clear that it's because you're full of the devil. Somebody say amen, right? No. (laughs) 
I, I, I get there real quick, you know, partake my justice work. I try to be self-reflective in my meetings, be like, okay, now obviously, you know, this, you know, why are you so racist and homophobic and imperialistic and violent? Is, is there something in me that, 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 that's, that, that makes you that way or makes me so triggered by it? And I do try to spend time there, but I seem to always come out with the same, no, not the same, but you know. <laughs> Self-reflection does not keep us from criticizing. But the word in the Greek around criticism and, and judging was a, a very uh, important kind of word. It, it means a harsh, self-righteous, hypercritical judgment. So when the scripture says, judge not that ye be not judged, you ought to replace that one word, judge, with this whole description, do not offer harsh, self-righteous, hypercritical judgments unless you want to be offered harsh, self-righteous, hypercritical judgments. Does that make sense? So often we may read the text and reduce the text to a word that is not necessarily what Jesus was attempting to communicate. Jesus is not asking you to be silent about your pain. So you don't judge folk. I think Zora Neale Hurston said it best, right? If you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. It's not what Jesus is asking you to do. Jesus is asking us to ask ourselves, how can we Take a moment of self-reflection before or in place of our knee-jerk reaction to criticize, to offer harsh, critical, self-righteous judgments. And I want to believe that many of us are in relationships all across the board where we are more prone to offer harsh, critical, self-righteous responses, particularly when it's with people we do not like. But this is what uh, Thomas Akempis, I spent most of the day looking for this quote, and uh, I was so confused, uh, and, and I realized I was looking for the quote from Thomas Merton, and it was actually Thomas Akempis. He was a I think, 13th century uh, 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 mystic, and he says, if you believe there is good in you, believe there is more in your neighbor. It will help you preserve humility. You want to talk about a Jedi mind trick, right? If you believe there's anything good in you, now this helps me out a lot, particularly with people that I don't like, I disagree with, or I don't care for. What does it mean for me to take a moment to be self-reflective so I can try to find the good yeah. in them? Yeah. Even if I'm getting ready to offer self, I mean, offer a, 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 a description of their behavior that may create some tension, can I still find the good in them? Uh, one of my coaches, uh, his name was Antonio, was my, one of my best friends, Antonio Cediel, one of our earliest members of the church. He used to talk about uh, how to have uh, uh, a difficult conversation. He coaches principals all across the country on how to have difficult conversations. And he says that before you offer your criticism, give three examples of the good things that they've done. And, you know, when he first told me that, because I was doing some stuff in my job, I was like, man, that sounds like I'm manipulating them. You know, like I'm just kind of pumping them up. And, and, and his point to me was, well, you know, you could think of it that way. Or you could think of it as you are attempting to honor their humanity, take the edge off your own critique, and create space for them to hear what you are trying to say. That kind of intentionality, I believe, helps us to move beyond the harsh, critical, hypercritical judgments into something that creates space for redemption, learning, 
and growing. I never forget when we got arrested in Ferguson and I was in the jail with uh, number of folks, my brother, Dr. Cornell West, and, and a bunch of the young folks from Ferguson, and I was sitting in the jail, and I was just upset, I was mad, and Dr. West, you know, when he was getting arrested, you know, they booking him, and he's just kind of like, oh, thank you, dear brother, thank you, dear sister. And I'm just like, what is your problem? You know, these racist people don't do, oh, thank you, dear brother, thank you, dear sister. Oh, you need me to stand right here? Stand there, you know, okay, you need me to, okay, bless you, dear brother. And I, we sat there in the jail like, Doc. <laughs> oh, dear brother, dear brother, dear brother. Always leave the porch light on for people because you never know when they're going to come home. <laughs> this, to me, is the art of self-reflection versus criticism, hypercriticism. So, First set of questions, are your criticisms ever tempered by self-reflection? Again, self-reflection does not take the, the, the observations that you need to offer to folks off the table, but it should temper the way in which you communicate. At least that is what I want to offer as a suggestion. How do you speak the truth while holding space for redemption, learning, and growing. Mm -hmm. the, the first step, first point, self-reflect versus criticizing. Second point that I want to lift up from the text that I think is helpful for us, and again, you'll find some of this in our curriculum for uh, these first several sessions. How do we clarify our expectations versus assuming we're all on the same page? Amen. Now, again, I, I, I think, you know, I want to start this conversation off with the text as it relates to God, where it says, don't bargain with God, be direct, ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. Right. And so if our relationships are grounded in God and the scriptures, as we rightly or not rightly, but more frequently describe, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock at the door will be open. What does it mean for us? To, again, take seriously that clarifying our expectations rather than assuming we're all on the same page is a constant need if we are going to be in healthy relationships. Now, God's expectations for us are often clear as day until they're not. And this is why... Our relationships with God must always be grounded in prayer and consistent communication yeah, yeah. because we are often learning and unlearning things at the same time. Yeah, right. Anybody ever learned something about God when you were young or even when you were older and then the more you lived, the more experiences you had, you had to unlearn some of those things and learn something new, right? If you are in a constant relationship with God that requires learning and unlearning, um, imagine how much learning and unlearning you have to do in your relationships with people, systems, with creation. Amen. Things that we thought were true about creation decades ago, we have had to unlearn them and relearn something new. Things that you thought were true about your country, you had to unlearn some things, learn some things new. Things you thought were true about your family and about yourself, you had to unlearn some things and learn some things new. Clarifying your expectations while you are in relationships, they often help you get access to knowledge that is attainable, but that often is elusive. I was trying to put this in a nice kind of summarizing uh, frame, and I, I thank uh, uh, Sharice for giving me some input on this. Uh, Prejudging often emerges from false assumptions that get in the way of knowledge that is attainable. When the scripture talks about you and I uh, jumping into judging, often our judging emerges from false assumptions. And we find the lethality of false assumptions around us all the time. Our dear sister who was killed in her home while playing video games yesterday, was killed by a police officer who had false assumptions. And it's not clear if his assumptions were about hatred or anger or fear, 
but he did not check his assumptions, and his assumptions led to the death of someone who had no ill, Ill uh, 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 feelings or intent toward him. That is kind of perhaps the, the most radical expression of the lethality of false assumptions. But think of all the times in your life where you prejudged from a false assumption. And it created all kinds of obstruction to knowledge about that person, that thing, that situation that was readily at your disposal, uh, readily at your, <laughs> within your reach. Grasp, thank you. It is very important for you and I to take seriously what does it mean for us to keep clarifying. Ask questions when in doubt, ask questions. Get clear about expectations. Because false assumptions can cause life to be stifled in your relationships, or they may even cause your relationships to peter off. So next question, particularly, do you make clear ask to God and those you're in relationships with? And what are the healthy ways to overcome fear, rejection, or disappointments which get in the way of you boldly asking for what you need or want? It is indeed a point of fact that often we fear rejection, we fear the answer, we overcompensate for our anxieties, and those things keep us from clarifying what we don't know. But I have been told in therapy and all other kind of places that you can never overcome false assumptions without asking more questions. In every relationship, on your job, in your family, in your marriage, with your children, with yourself, with God, keep asking questions until you unlearn what you have been convinced of is true, which may not always be reflective of what is real. Last thing we'll say, just for uh, the sake of wrapping this up, is you and I must always make sure our relationships are grounded in mutuality versus coercion. Mutuality, a willing, voluntary, knowing exchange of connection versus coercion. This is, for me, I think a, a beautiful expression of what the text says. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will even be better? God's creation of the world, of you, of I, even God's saving of the world, is a deep reflection of God's love for us. God did not have to do any of it. <laughs> Amen. God was not like, hmm, what, what a universe is broad, expansive, what do I want to do today? I think I am required to go down here and like put myself in harm's way on behalf of these hard-headed folk that I, you know. No, God could be like, I hope they figure that out because I got other things to worry about. I'm running the universe up in here. Somebody say amen, right? But God's love is so deep for us that God kept offering mutual reach outreach to us. And I want to submit that our relationships must always be grounded in this same mutuality. Not coercion, where it's like you feel forced to do something with the threat of violence looming. And all of us, many of us, who live in the kind of context we live in, an empire, imperialistic context, we are often so formed by coercion, we don't often know how at work it is within us. And this is why, again, these messages from the Lord are constantly being brought to us. What does it mean to rid yourself of coercion as your tool to make relationships work? Oh, it's such a hard thing, especially when you are situated in systems of hierarchy and systems where power relationships are often uneven. And, and when folk don't do what you want them to do and you feel like, well, I'm just going to pull a lever on you. 
Amen. It's, it's, it's easier to do that than it is to just sit and be like, you know, how can we live out mutuality? Yeah. Out of a deep love and mutual agreement. And I do believe that one of the greatest opportunities that we have been given during this series is to lean into how can I practice mutuality in my relationships, all of my relationships, or as many of the relationships that I can. Now, mutuality requires two willing parties. It's hard to be in a relationship with mutuality with someone who is unwilling, yeah. right? And so sometimes you, 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 you go through the self-reflection phase, you go through the clarifying expectations phase, and you hear the mutuality phase, and you sit, sit, realize, you know what, this person is not an honest broker. So it's hard to be in a mutual relationship with someone who's not honest. Right. So I'm going to create some boundaries that are not violent, but that are, you know, they, they, they make sure, you know, that you go, if you're going to cross this boundary, I'm going to have enough notice to make sure that harm is not done. But I do believe that mutuality, love, deep love has the power to bring many relationships back into harmony. And I pray that this series, this season, allows us to practice that in ways that bring life to all of us. Amen. Stand to your feet, everyone, and let's, let's prepare to pray. Grab the hand of someone next to you. God, I pray for the person I'm touching. You know the relationships that they are in. You know the challenges that persist. You know, God, all the many ways that relationships, relationships that start with you, the relationships that, 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 that remind us that we are dependent on you. We are dependent on your model, your lessons, your, your, your commands. Lord, that, that all of our relationships, Lord, if they are at their best and if they are the most healthy, they reflect the deep mutual commitment you've made to us, that you offer us a way forward and you invite us to walk therein. So God, I pray that as, Lord, we learn to be formed by your relational ways, God, that we then would in turn be transformed ourselves to be relational in this same manner. Help us, God, to be reflective of our own, Lord God, uh, uh, ways that are in need of your correction, in need of your healing, in need of your help. Lord God, so we can indeed offer even the, the feedback that is necessary in ways that leave the porch light on for redemption, learning, and growing. I pray, God, that we will clarify all these expectations that are often so unknown to us. Lord God, things that we assume we know that must be interrogated. And even, Lord God, in a world where injustice and fragmentation and, 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 and all the isms of the world situate us in relationships that are often grounded in bias and prejudice and othering. I pray, God, that you will help us, Lord, to ask more questions when we don't know, Lord God, and help us to be in relationships with one another and ourselves that are life-giving. And we'll say thank you, God. Lift those hands right where you are, Lord. It's me. And we stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, my father, my sister, or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord. And I need your love. I need your power. I need your strength. I need your healing. Help me, Lord. Somebody say, help me, Lord. Heal me, Lord. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Strengthen me, Lord. Somebody say, strengthen me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to know that what you have for me, I need you to bring it to fruition. Help me to know and to be clear about what you require of me, what others require of me, what I require of myself. And we'll say thank you, Lord, in all of these things that the people of God say amen. Give the Lord a hand. Praise everybody. God bless you today.